Now seeking table 118 with DJ Damage. Welcome to the chaos. Yo, what up, everybody? We back on the chaos. What's up, Danny? What's up, Mikey? How you been? I'm fucking great. How are How's you? How's your week? Oh, the week's been awesome. I'm very excited about today's episode. Yeah, today's been nuts, man. I, I'm enjoying the, the the energy. Oh, man, it's definitely been a flow. This new everything going on in the world. We're, we're definitely rocking out. But today we got somebody special in the studio. Radio host, TV personality, nightclub DJ. This man has bounced all over. Currently hosting a show on iHeartRadio called Hollywood Uncensored. Ladies and gentlemen, DJ Damage. What hey, up, hey. Bro? Yo. I appreciate the intro, fellas. Thank you. Oh, always. We, gotta, we always gotta we always gotta hype everybody up on this show because we're here to talk about some cool shit and give people a fucking story. Okay, well, talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. He's bringing the energy, bringing man. Dancing in. already. Yeah, but let's let's just kick it off. Let's give out. Let's give our viewers a little bit of a background as to like who you are, how you got into the industry the club dj how that turned into the tv personality radio personality thing and everything you're doing now because man you were doing a lot you everywhere that's a long story but no i Let's started off notes yeah yeah yeah. so I, I grew up in philly uh i'm from philly born and raised in philly and i got into djing because my brother is an artist and he's still an artist to this day so that's how i originally got into music so ever since i could remember i was a dj because my brother was always an artist i'm talking about there used to be those like little toy um, keyboards. Do y'all remember that? Oh, yeah. yeah. And like you used to have like a hip hop button on there. Yep. And the beat used to go do 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 do. And I would speed it up and slow it down. And he was like, "Yeah, you my DJ." And that's how it started. Was so it Casio? Turned, the Casio? Yeah, yeah. It was like, a, but it was worse than it was like really like Toys R Us, like special. Brand. I miss Toys R Us. Oh my god, bring it back. Right. So when I turned about twelve, I was like mowing lawns and stuff, and I bought my own DJ in a box setup from Newmark. And literally, I just took it from there. So I started off like eighth grade, and I've been DJing ever since, to be honest. So um, when everybody was going to track practice, I was in, uh, well, I went to boarding school. I'm skipping a lot of, yo, it's, it's such a long story. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to boarding school. So at the boarding school, the first year I went there, they opened up a community center called The Hum. So when I first went into The Hum, they had like the movie theater, they had like vending machines and stuff. And then they had like this mini nightclub in there. And I ran over, and it was a DJ booth. And I'm like, oh, it's about to get lit. So that's how I started. So I started working at the Hum after school. So when people were going to basketball practice, soccer practice, I was going in at the Hum to practice. And I literally did that every day until I graduated. Nice. nice. Did awesome. you start on vinyls? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that was all it was back yeah, then. Yeah. Oh, you, had your milk crate. you had your milk crate full <laughs> of your- I got like, like four crates, but like I had nothing special. I had like uh like Nelly's like B-sides on vinyl. Like nothing. <laughs> like, when Serato came, I threw everything away. I had nothing classic. I had like Mace Brief sh- uh Brief Stretch Shake on vinyl. Nobody wanted that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I was going to school and all I wanted to do was DJ and my music teacher was like, I'm gonna um take you to Temple University because they have a great communications program. Because he was like, what do you want to do? And I was like, I just want to DJ. And he was like, well, you don't want to do radio? And I was like, all right, yeah, sure. <laughs> so he was like, that's called communication. So he walked me into Temple. He knew um, a professor there, uh, Professor Klotz. And I was kind of like, while well, I was in high school, going to check it out. And that was my number one choice. Temple was walking distance from my house. And then I went to, that's where I went to school. I went to school, you know, everybody's trying to be doctors and lawyers. I went to be a DJ. And that's what I did. I went on campus trying to join all the organizations. No one accepted me. And I started my own group called Stay With Entertainment. And it was all the freshmen because I lived off campus because I was from the neighborhood. I linked up with like some football players and they're like, yo, you got your own house off campus? I'm like, yeah. So he was bringing all the girls through and I had the <laughs> DJ set up. So all the girls were like, how come you don't do none of the big parties? I'm like, you have to tell the promoters. They don't, they don't know me. And, you know, slowly but surely I went from opening to you know closing all the main events and it was dope because i was such a big deal at my school that my brother who i said is an artist got to open at our homecoming for nas he's he's he didn't finish high school okay so you can imagine a boy that never finished high school opening for nas at a college that's how much we had the school on lock yo he was like van wilder yeah it was like (laughs) like, (laughs) right yo definitely we had it lit so um and I'm just running through this, dude. There was so many stories. Like, we had um, a collection of, like, 15 girls. We had them all in T-shirts. And when I used to open, because I wasn't, like, the headliner, we would have, like, 15, 30 girls in our T-shirts. And they're like, yo, who are these dudes? <laughs> and, like, and they, and they would stay and celebrate in one of my sets over. And they're like, yo, this is crazy. So um, um, 
I, I met somebody named Brown B and she walked me into like the radio process because she wanted to always do radio. I was just DJing at the time. She was a little older. She was like 26, but, you know, went back to school kind of thing. But she did promotions for the radio station. And her best friend was this uh, assistant program director at our local radio station. So she was going to school and creating her demo so she could be on air. So while she's creating her demo on our radio show, her best friend's like, yo, who's the DJ? And she's like, oh, that's damaged. And you're like, yo, he's, he's pretty good. Like, and long, like, long story short, my sophomore year, I was able to get my first job in radio. So the guy that went there, you know, didn't really have a clear cut vision, but to be a DJ, got his job sophomore year. So I was going to school and doing radio until I graduated. Yo, isn't that dope, though, like how you just knew you wanted a DJ and that's you're it. like, I'm going to figure everything else out. And it just kind of fell fucking in line for him. Like, yo, that's how you know you were on the path you were meant to be on. Because every time I've talked to you, you've always known you wanted a DJ. Dude, that's that was it. Like, I didn't want to play sports. I was like literally every day DJing. Now, it's so funny because today I don't DJ as much because I've done it all my life. Like, that's all I've ever did. Everybody knows me as when I was in high school, the DJ boy. In my neighborhood, that's the DJ boy. Like, everybody, it's not like it was today where everybody got a, you know, $500 controller. Like, to be a DJ took a lot of commitment. You had to buy the records, you had to buy the mixers, you had to buy the needles. So to be 12, 13 out there at the park DJing was like, oh, yeah, we know him. It's the DJ boy. Yeah, you so really shy. It's just, it's, it's a crazy story. So that's how we got through that part of life. I like that you didn't let, uh, when you got to college and, you, you know, you said the organizations didn't let you in, you didn't let that hold you back. You're like... All right, all these doors got shut in my face. I'm going to create my own door. Yeah. And, and, and open it up to other people. I mean, I'm guessing you helped other people too. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and you have to have some bit of arrogance in your, I feel like when you're on the come up, you have to have some bit of arrogance because you will get discouraged. Like, you know, mad people weren't trying to book me. Or when I did finally get an event, it wasn't like the popping event. So nobody was there. And I was just like, whatever. And I met my, on my homeboy, Keith Holt. I just talked to him the other day, and I was like, you got to come to my birthday party because it's a full circle moment. He was the football player who was on scholarship, broke his neck. Oh. They had to – he was fine, though. He was fine, but broke his neck. So he was just riding it out because he had a full ride, and he was just partying every day. So if it wasn't for him having that energy and going, oh, you have your own crib? Like, because he was partying in the dorms and getting in trouble. I was just like off camera, like, man, we can do whatever we want here. Like, I live in the hood. So <laughs> if it wasn't for him, it wouldn't have been that – and, you know, so many other people I could shout out, but that was like that pinnacle moment where the girls, the it girls, because, he's, you know, he's the football player, yeah. were going, yo, dude, you need to start DJing like the big events. And I'm like, yo, just let the promoters know. And they did. So then once you got with the promoters, that's how you kind of got into the Philly kind of club scene a little bit. Oh, no, so and that's where it got interesting because um, it was two different scenes. I'm coming from the college scene and Philly is its own scene. Mm. So when I started DJing the way I was, I was doing college tours. I was doing... You know, Drexel, U Penn, uh, Millersville, IUP, Kutztown, uh, UMass. So I'm doing all the colleges. It wasn't until I got into radio when I started jumping into the nightlife of Philadelphia. That was different. And a lot of the promoters in Philly thought, oh, he's just a college kid. He can't handle, you know, a grown and sexy 25 and up crowd because he's 19. He can't do it. Like it was like back then they made it such a big deal to do a 25 and up club. I'm like. It's the same music, y'all. So, that, honestly, it wasn't like that. It, it took a while to get yeah, into that okay. Philly club scene. So, what was that like, though, mentally? Because you got it's got to be a little frustrating. Like, hey, I just did this whole college tour. I'm the man on campus. Everybody knows me. Now you're trying to get to that next spot, and people aren't fucking with you. It's always been like that. And, I've, and that's where I realized, like, that's my comfort zone. Like, when people are not fucking with me, I know something good is about to happen. Because before we even get into the Philly club scene, just when I got on radio... All the dudes I looked up to, because I'm the only young guy on radio. Like, it's like legendary dudes on radio. All the dudes I looked up to, they kind of like was not messing with me. Like, there was a dude that I love. I'm not going to shout him out because we're cool now. <laughs> this dude went on air at noon. We're on the same radio station. And he's dissing me, and we're on the same radio station. I'm like, who does this? Who disses the DJ on the same? I've never seen that before. So it was always pushback. So it was pushback with that. And, you know, I started off on radio doing 10 o'clock. Nobody listens to the radio at 10 o'clock, and I had to move my way up. So the nightlife scene was interesting because my cousin was one of the biggest promoters, and he wasn't booking me. And it took, it took a, a, full, like a while for me to start really getting booked by him and starting doing other clubs. So it, it took a minute. 
That's fucking wild. It's very wild. So when you look first, back at it. Yeah. What was that first big break? The first club? Your what first 25 first and up? Club? <laughs> I can't remember. I, it, it probably is still a flyer still on my Instagram. I have a lot of posts still on my Instagram. Uh, and it probably was one where I was wearing like this suit. Like I was like, I am grown and sexy. <laughs> But I, I didn't care because the college scene was so lit. It was just like, all right, whatever. I'm doing college tours. I'm doing homecomings. I'm doing thousands of kids. I don't care about your grown and sexy party. But it was just interesting that people will always try to put you in a box. So anybody has that trying to do anything, just remember, people will put you in a box. People will always try to label you because that's just how people think. They That's how they categorize things. That's how they understand things by putting it in a box. It's up to you to show them, like, no, I'm not just in this box. Yeah. That's that's super cool because, like, I mean, just from getting to know you, you're one of those people where it's like, yo, if somebody puts you in the box, you're like, yo, I'm going to do whatever I want. So it's like it seems like in this industry because now you've gone on to now you do photography, you yeah. do, you host, you do radio, you do talk show. Like, how did you have that audacity to be like, yo, I don't give a fuck. I'm going to do it all. I think it's just being curious, man. Like, I always because when I, when I started doing radio, um, I bought like a camera off this crackhead. <laughs> and, no seriously like and, and that's how i got into photography and i was like yo we got to shoot our party so like this dude had this super dope canon for 20 dollars on the street i was like yo give me that right right it's <laughs> really so much for that type of stuff and that's how i got into photography and i had to make my own graphics because i was doing college tours and i you know back then everybody wasn't you know the graphic designer like they are now you know it was like an acquired skill to use photoshop now it's like yo you got all types of apps so i had to learn how to do that so these are the hobbies that I had back then that grew to be now real hustles that I have today. Like, I really do photography for Serato. I know how to make graphics. I know how to do video editing. These are things I was just doing just as a DJ trying to do my own thing. But, yeah, I think it's just being curious, like, just being open-minded to it. Like, yeah. you know, not going, I don't know, just, like, really just being curious. Like, I love to be, and I think me being a DJ in the real sense, and I'm, I'm going to explain this. A DJ is supposed to support the artist. And I feel like along the line, the DJ wanted to become the star, which is totally fine. But I always wanted to be in the background. So that's why I was always into the photography, into the production, into, oh, what does this camera do? What's going on? I, I, like when I worked at Revolt, I didn't even get there yet, I would be in the pit with my camera with the cameraman because I just love that type of stuff. And I feel like that's what also helped me push me a little farther because I'm not thirsty to be in front of this camera i'm not thirsty for that so i was able to pivot and have other opportunities that maybe if people that just want to be the star wanted to do they probably will overlook that type of stuff yeah definitely because like th those are huge things i mean on this show now thank god we have nick <laughs> to do all the audio because me and daddy have no idea how to set up the equipment chop the equipment and if it wasn't for this guy our podcast would not nearly sound <laughs> anywhere as good shout out to our producer nick we just Dewars. be sitting here talking bullshit yeah all day <laughs> it wouldn't get anywhere <laughs> it'd be good conversation but that's Did you record about, that on your phone that's all that's all we'd have at this fucking point so nick thank you hey please tell me you still have that craghead camera uh, no, so <laughs> interesting thing about that camera. So I let my boy hold it. He never gave it back, and now he runs the um, the production company for Cam Newton. So me giving him that camera helped propel him to do photography for Cam Newton. He started his own company, Man, and now when you camera. see all Cam Newton's <laughs> videos, commercials, anything for Under Armour, my boy did that and it all started kind of like from that camera that's amazing that's fucking <laughs> wow. yeah. I'm gonna start buying all my gear from crackheads on the street dude. <laughs> oh I miss Philly Dude, for that man. I bought so much stuff from crackheads <laughs> <laughs> oh Philly's one city I wanna I wanna visit dude good luck <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm not going <laughs> alright maybe I won't <laughs> maybe, maybe you will. I'm just gonna pop in and eat some cheese things. But <laughs> yeah, that's all I want. That's all I want to do. That, I mean, that's fucking dope as hell, though, because yo, know, like you said, not many people nowadays can do can wear that many hats. And like, kind of way the the industry works is you don't get to wear that many hats anymore. But somebody like you is like an anomaly that can do all of this. You're your own one man team. Well, because I, I, and I teach hosting. I tell people you have to have more than one skill because how are you gonna be valuable when you're on your way up? Like, okay, a lot of people see me, and I'm still on my way up. You know, of course, but I have a lot of connections, but I work for them. So how are you going to leverage and add to somebody's something to be valuable? You know what I'm saying? It's not all about gimme, gimme, gimme. Oh, please, please, please. It's like, hey, you know, I can cut hair. Oh, you know, I can do photography for you. Like, you have to give value to get value. Yeah. It just starts like that. It's, it's all about the network. And that's something, we, Danny, we've learned and we talk, we talk about a lot here is that something about this nightlife scene, it's like there is a good group of people. 
And if you can get in cool with certain people and then, you know, you have something to offer. Mm-hmm. This is how we've gotten so many things in, throughout our careers and where we are now. Yeah, I mean, we're, we were willing to do stuff. Like in the nightclub scene, we didn't just TSA. We knew how to bartend. Yeah. You know, yeah. We, we knew how to sweep shit up. Yeah. <laughs> but, but we also knew but how we to. we worked hard and we were willing to learn whatever else, whatever you needed us to do. And we also knew how to talk to people the right way and take care of people, which ultimately led us to moving into all these different streams and avenues and things that we all fucking do. So, I mean, that's definitely great advice to have. All right, so let's keep going with your story then because now you mentioned Revolt. I mean, bro, you do so many Lord, fucking things. bro. So what is Revolt? Revolt was, um, and it still is, uh, Sean Combs, Sean Diddy Combs Television Network. Okay. So I was one of the first hosts to be on there. He put, like, this worldwide search to go on. That story, oh, my God, this story. I have to tell, tell the story. It. yeah. And this is where manifestation, I don't know if people are spiritual, and if you're not, I get it, but if you are, how are you? I'm your brother. Um, I remember it was a point in time at when I was in Philly and I felt like I did it all. I was like, I mean, I was so young, but I've accomplished so much. I'm like, I did radio. Like, I didn't expect me to get on radio until I was like in my late thirties or some type of shit like that. So like, I'm sitting here with my manager at the time and she's like, what's next? And I was like, I don't know. She was like, well, maybe you should do TV. And I was like, well, okay. So I, we, I write down a bunch of things. She was like, just write down some goals. And I told her. I said, when I write stuff down, shit gets scary. When I write stuff down, things happen. She was like, whatever, just write it down. <laughs> so I wrote down that I wanted to be on 106 in Park. I swear to God, two months later, I get a call from the producers telling me they want me to do 106 in Park. I don't know anybody in New York, wow. let alone 106 in Park. And they're reaching out to my manager via email like, hey, we think he'll be great for 106 in Park. That's fucking... So through 106 in Park, I did a couple guest spots, and they told me... I had the job. Like, I did um, a few of the things with Roxy and Terrence. I was DJing, and it was one random day they called me up there, and they're like, yeah, you know, these are the new hosts of 106 and Park. And I'm looking like, what? <laughs> and, and, like, the whole, like, the whole <laughs> Philly season. So that never happened. Like, they, they did that. They put me on the website, and they never called me in. They did, like, a new contest search for 106 and Park, and I never got called in for the job. I wasn't pissed, though, because I honestly didn't feel like I was the best TV host at the time, and they put me on their website. So I was leveraging the shit out of that for DJ gigs. Oh, I'm yeah. like, yeah, I'm official correspondent for BT. Look at this. I got, like, I, the link is probably still on the website. That's how funny it is. <laughs> like, I don't even know if they knew that was still up there. So what happened was um, about a year later, I guess the people from 106 and Park went over to Revolt, and they were looking for hosts. And a dude was like, uh, shout out to my boy Eric Watson. He was the executive producer and one of the producers for um, Rap City to the Basement, 106 and Park, uh, His from the Street, stuff like that. He was like, there was a guy we were supposed to have. We should reach back out to him. And that's how I got reached out to for the Revolt gig. So it's so funny if I never got turned down from, uh, from 106 and Park, I would have never got the Revolt gig. It was just full circle moments that's it's it's crazy like it you, always works out right like always but i'm sure like you were i mean like you said you leveraged the shit out of it but there was had to be a part of you that was like all right well kind of fucking sucks though i'm on the website hey, you it, introduced it me it sucked a little bit but i knew i wasn't ready yeah so i wasn't it wasn't like a total letdown it wasn't like oh i knew i was the best for this job i was like bro i can't even first of all i'm dyslexic so i couldn't even read the teleprompter so i'm like i don't know what would happen anyway <laughs> that's what i was thinking it was more of a technical learning the techniques of being in front of camera, right? That No, that's the easy part. It's reading. It's just the, <laughs> just the reading. Me. I just, I can't even spell your podcast, let alone <laughs> read a prompter. <laughs> it's reading. <laughs> I know my flaws. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> but it gets weirder. So before even the BT situation, um, I had an idea. I was like, okay, I want to do TV, right? So how do you do TV without doing TV? So I was like, I'm going to create my own television show. So I used to DJ for the store called Sneaker Villa at the time. Now it's like DTLR something in the East Coast. And this was one of the first stores that had like TVs in each store. And they had programming. They didn't have that in Philly like that. I don't know if that was a New York thing. But like, you know what I'm saying? Like you go into yeah. the sneaker store, you see a TV. So I was like, yo, I'm going to make a show for the TV. Because it plays in all the stores. So I pitched it to the people. They was like, yo, we love it. So we start shooting. Because I was doing radio at the time, I was able to get Michael Vick, Meek Mill, like huge names, the game. I had big names for my TV show. So my boy I give the camera to, right? He's supposed to edit it and produce it. It comes down to the deadline. 
he doesn't edit or produce it. And they paid us ahead of time. They paid us to do it. He got paid and he just kind of flaked. So when he flaked, I was like, yo, you, you screwed me. And like, this is a company that did this on faith through my connection. I work with them. And to make it up, he made me a reel from that content. That's the reel that helped me get in the door of BT. That's the reel that helped me get in the door for Revolt. If I didn't have that reel, I would have had nothing. So to him messing up and screwing up and doing that for me actually helped me more than probably doing that TV show that would have been on the little screens because I had compiled um, footage to give people. And I had big names on there. Meek Mill, I had The Game, I had... Michael Vick, people from the city. I had like huge names yeah. on there, so it made me look good. And he he really did his thing on it because he felt bad. Isn't it wild where you like you, you're at this point in your life now where you know you said you're still on the come up, you're successful, you're thriving, but now you can look back and realize why everything happened the way it did. You can connect the dots and be like, oh, that sucked at that point, but I'm so fucking grateful that that didn't work out. Bro, like you think I'm done? I have the wildest stories. Oh, well, that's why we have <laughs> that's why we have you like, here. You don't Keep even going. understand. Like I have stories that it, it still creeps me out. So. Um, I'm a heavy hitter DJ now. I don't know if y'all know what that is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm a heavy hitter well, DJ. Well, explain it to everybody. Anybody else? Oh, uh, heavy hitter DJ is like a DJ fraternity. Um, it was created by DJ Enough, who was Puffs, uh, not Puffs, who was uh, Biggie's DJ, and it's like all the best DJs around the country, around the world. Honestly, we got people in Tokyo, Switzerland, all types of stuff. So before I was a heavy hitter, they needed a heavy hitter in my region, which was the Philadelphia area, and. Floyd Mayweather was always good with promoting his flights. You know how he is. Mm-hmm. So he was flying out DJs from each city to interview him to promote his big fight. So I wasn't a heavy hitter yet, but they let me fly out to be a part of this. And I was like, oh, this is a big deal, right? So on his flight, you know, it's a guy named James Cruz. He coordinates it. Um, I met my boy Eli, who's his assistant, whatever. It doesn't matter. So, you know, I get there, I get to interview Floyd. It's an amazing experience. I'm like, I would have never thought I would be, first of all, flying to Vegas. I've never been to Vegas. I'm like 21 at the time. I've never been outside of Philly, like Jersey maybe. Um, And it was just a dope experience. So on the way back, this is where the revolt thing starts. On the way back, I get a random call on my cell phone. I'm talking about I'm strapped in an airplane. I get a call and they're like, hey, um, is this DJ Damage? I'm like, yeah. She's like, hey, this is Val. Um, Puff wants to speak to you. Excuse me? <laughs> this Bring is, it up on me. What is this is DJ Damage, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is Val. Puff wants to speak to you. I'm like, to me? <laughs> yes. Are you able to speak? I'm like, yo, I'm literally on the plane right now about to take off. I cannot have this conversation. Then I'm thinking like, when Puff calls you, do you run off the fucking, like, what do you do? Seriously, I'm going to ask y'all. When Puff calls you, what do you do? Do you get off the plane? Like, what do you do? I would have got off the plane. You, you stay on the phone, bro. Uh, yeah, you, 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 I would have got off the plane on some, like, friend shit. Did you get off yeah. the plane? To stay on, I, yeah. I would have got off the plane. How yeah, would I got home? But, I, I would have figured it out later. Wait, but the doors were closed? Like, you were like you were about to... We didn't taxi yet, but the okay. doors are closed. Oh, well, you're about to get a $25,000 fine. And right. That's what jail, I'm saying. Like, and, and, I, and I have a newborn kid at this time. I'm like, I have to go home. I'd probably start yelling. Yeah, I'm so, like, oh, ah, Pop Daddy! Pop Daddy! Help me! <laughs> So, whoo, uh, so I don't take the call oh, and shit. I don't hear anything for two weeks, but I do hear something. So I thought I blew it. I was like, well, whatever opportunity that I was supposed to have, it's gone because I didn't pick up the call. I get a call on Sunday night, midnight, like, hey, this is damaged, right? Yeah. Puff wants to meet with you tomorrow at four o'clock. Where? In New York. <laughs> huh? <laughs> How the, what? First of all, how am I getting to New York? Second, I, at this time, work the morning show. I had a 2 o'clock mix. I had a 6 p.m. mix, and I had my own night show. How the hell am I supposed to just travel to New York out of nowhere when I am basically the radio station? So I'm sitting there scratching my head. First of all, I just told her, I was like, at this point, I'm, just, I'm coming. I'm coming. Yeah. yeah. So after I told her I'm coming, I was like, how am I going to figure this out? So I went to the radio station because I worked... At the night show, they had, um, I had the lanyard. I had the, the beep, beep, whatever you want to call that. I can't think of it right now. The card to get in the door. The card to get in the door. <laughs> <laughs> so I go in there, and I make like 10 mixes all night long. I'm just like mixing, mixing, and I put them on CD, and I text every jock like, yo, I'm not going to be here. I left the mix on the CD. Do whatever the hell you got to do. And this is when my program director at the time was the biggest B-I-T-C-H, like one of the worst, most hating, most negative people on earth. And I was like, fuck it, I might lose my job, but Puff is calling. 
So I drive up there to New York. For the second time. The second you gotta time. Go. You gotta oh, go. I had to go. <laughs> I drive up there to New York, and we get in, 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 in the spot, and it's four of us. It's me, my girl Hannah Rad, a uh, dude named Rodney Rakai, who works at Revolt now, and um, some Russian girl. So we're sitting there, and it's like, it's cold, and it's chilling. It's just like a weird vibe. It's like, yeah, we about to go meet with Puff. So it was like this little waiting room area, like kind of like we're sitting down, and then we go up the elevator, and like we go into this big-ass cubicle room. Where it has like the detachable wall. So you can hear Puff on the phone. Like it's like those, you know, y'all probably know more than me, like the corporate detachable yeah. walls. So they like, you know, micing us up. And I'm like, why are y'all micing us up? And like they're bringing out cameras, like, how do y'all feel? And I'm like, am I on a reality show I didn't sign a release for? Like, <laughs> how are y'all filming me right now? Like, I don't even know what's happening. So I hear this dude screaming in the hallway, like, yo, what the, f-? you know, just real New York turned up kind of guy, right? So I hear him coming close to the room. I'm like, oh, Lord, what's about to happen here? When a dude walks in the door, it's the guy, James Cruz, the same guy that organized the flights for Floyd Mayweather back then when they first called me. That's the guy that organized everybody's flights and everything for the Floyd Mayweather fight when I went to Vegas for the first time. So mind you, I know of him. I do not know him. I've never spoken to him. He's like, big dog, you don't speak to him. He's like, damn it, what the fuck is up, man? What's up, dude? I'm like, huh? <laughs> Yo, you didn't tell me you was going for this? I was like, I don't even know you like that. He was like, you're a heavy hitter now. You're my brother. I'm a heavy hitter. I was like, oh, shit, you're a heavy hitter? <laughs> like, I just thought he was organizing the flights. I didn't know he, like, he was part of the team. <laughs> He was like, I'm telling Puff to get the fuck off the phone right now. I was like, wait, 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 wait. Don't, 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 don't disrupt him. <laughs> and I'm saying, like, wait, don't. Wait a minute. Like, don't, don't antagonize. So you hear him, doop, doop, doop. You hear him going to the room. Puff, get off the fucking phone. I got somebody for you to interview. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> you still have no idea what you you're doing. I know I'm there to interview, I mean, basically for the job. Because, like I said, I'm what skipping. What was the job, though? Right. It's the job for Revolt. I'm sorry I'm skipping so many things because I will yeah. be, it's a long yeah, yeah. story. Like, y'all don't know when I went to go to New York to interview for Revolt. But this is basically, I knew it was for a Re- Revolt job. Yeah. Like, okay. I knew that. So he's telling Puff to get the fuck off the phone. And he's like, all right, we're ready to go. So it's like five cameramen. So when I get up, I have to go first now. Thanks, James Cruz. <laughs> like, I can't even let him fill somebody else out first. So I get up, and it's five camera dudes that are, like, satelliting me. And they're, like, walking when I walk. I was like, yo, this is really a TV show. So I get in there, and I sit down with Puff. And he just gives me this. You ever seen that Puff meme where, like, the dude was performing? I don't know if it was, like, some kind of American Idol kind of thing. He has that stuck face, like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he looked yeah. like me like that for, like, a few seconds. He was like. I'm looking at him like, okay. He was like, yo, matter of fact, I want you to come back, go out and come back in. I want to stand up when you came in. And when I tell you when he said that, all the nervousness in my body left. Left. Murdered the interview. Murdered the interview. Every, every chill I had, every sc- scarcity I had, just left. Because in my mind, and this might be stupid, I was prepared. I knew every executive at Revolt. I knew everything. I knew what I thought it wanted to be. I knew what I wanted to add. I had segment ideas. I was ready to go. I'm like, you get one chance. When he told me that he wanted to stand up instead of sitting down, I was like, he's going to wing it, and I'm not. And this is going to be good for me. And, you know, I, went, I left out. James Cruz came up to me. He's like, yo, I, I, Puff said you did good, but I'm going to put a word in for you, and uh, I feel like you're going to get the job. And long story short, I got the job. So what was the actual job though, Revolt? Just just a, I was the, the you main already... host for Revolt. I was the I did the live TV show on Revolt oh, Live. Oh shit. So I've interviewed Kendrick Lamar, Afrojack, Rick Ross, you name them, I interviewed them. Um Ice Cube, even bands, man, Birds of Tokyo. Uh, I I've uh, alt bands. So I've you talked to like everybody. Everybody. Everybody except Jay-Z. <laughs> <laughs> so far. So far. And uh Drake. I've never talked to Drake. Um, but yeah, I've interviewed mad people. And if you go, if anybody goes to my Instagram page at the real DJ damage and you scroll down, you'll see a lot of the footage. Everybody. We did a fast and furious takeover. I interviewed Vin Diesel in front of 2000 people for, for, for the original one for, uh, F7 F7. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Cause the original, that was, a, that was a yeah, not the original. Ago. Yeah. <laughs> I was like t- yeah. T- two, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I got the job and 
like I said, it gets weirder and weirder. I don't want to like you know keep talking. Like no, yo, no, 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 homie, keep talking. Yeah, please. Like, please, yo, please keep talking. We'll interject, but like, yo, your stories are fucking dope, and that's what we bro, it's like. Wow, bro, this is what we love about this podcast. That was like, yo, man, everybody comes in, and you're never sure what you're gonna get, but like, everybody has this crazy story. But yo, man, you have your inspiration on the fact that yo, you knew what you wanted. You didn't know what was gonna happen, but you went for it anyway. And look at all these incredible things that have happened to you. And wow. you know, I'm like, and there are so many people that are so afraid to take that step. There are so many people out there that are afraid to go after what they want. And you're living proof that yo, do it, and look at the wildness that's gonna come from it. Yeah, you gotta risk it all. You gotta risk it all. And I think this is the deep part about it, man. It's just really, truly manifestation because the first time I ever been to LA was that February before I moved to LA. So that was the first time I've ever been was for Grammy week. And I was like, I'm moving here. I don't know how. And throughout those months until October is when all this revolt stuff and everything happened where it came full circle, where I got a position to move to LA. I moved to LA on my birthday, October 4th. It's not a coincidence. Like I, they literally called me. It was like, yo, cause you know, they told me I had the job. I was like, I don't know when I'm going to start. You know, it was like, y'all could still be lying. I didn't sign any paperwork. Who knows if this is real? And they hit me up one day like, yo, can you come to L.A. next week, October 4th? I was like, that's my birthday. They was like, oh, happy birthday. Can you make it? I was like, hell yeah, yeah. I'm going to L.A. on my birthday. <laughs> like, yeah. fuck? Like, no, it's crazy shit, man. Crazy shit. Can't make it up. Can't make nah, it up. That's all. Yo, keep talking. We just so wow. Okay, so now you get to because you have so much more shit that you've done, and your show now is fucking. And one of your shows now is fucking huge. So like, okay, so now you get to LA. What's life like here in LA? What's it like leaving Philly in New York? I mean, obviously you came here for a purpose. Having revolt definitely yeah. made that move a lot easier. But you're in a new city. Got to prove yourself over again. So what was the mentality like coming all into that? Over again. Had to prove my. Oh my god. And then. The sad part was, do you know how many people, I didn't realize how many people went out for the job. So you're trying to network and everybody's kind of giving you a side eye like, I wanted the fucking job. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like you go into clubs and everything like, oh yeah, you're the revolt guy. You know, I, I waited in line for two hours to audition for that, man. I'm just like, okay, <laughs> like, all right. I don't know what to do with that. So it was tough, man. Like this is diff way different city, way different environment. Um, Hollywood, as you know, is its own monster. Mm -hmm. But I was on such a hustle when I got here that I just blew through. Like, I was always, like, I had nothing else to do. I had no friends, so I was, like, out every night networking. We had Revolt on our backs. I was, like, trying to make content, meeting around, meeting people. And I just, you know, made the city my bitch. I asked you this. <laughs> how many nights did you spend at Greystone? Because I guarantee you, me and... Because we talked about this. He moved here October 4th. I moved here December 4th of the same year. What year was that? 2013? Yeah, it's been... Not, it's I been, suck yeah. with years. My girl always laughs at me. I suck with years. It'll, it, yeah, I'll be, I'll be here nine years in December. So two, 2013, yeah. Yeah. So I wonder how many times me and you were working at Greystone while he was in there networking and partying. Definitely a time. few times because one of the... Uh, <laughs> Definitely a few times. One of the first things I did content-wise that I put together was we wanted I wanted to highlight DJ Orator because I always heard about the Greystone lifestyle, whatever. Yeah. So I was like, I, I, I uh, shout out to Ivan, man. He's so dope. He was uh, one of the head producers at Revolt at the time. He was like, yeah, go do it. Take a bunch of the cameramen. Go shoot that shit. So we went there to shoot Orator, and I happened to see, ding, 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 Floyd Mayweather and his team. And I stayed tight with them. So we were able to walk in through the back of Greystone with the cameras, kind of following Floyd just a little bit. You know, he couldn't, because you, you had to get approval, but we had the dopest experience going through the back. It was like, oh, the VIP experience. This is how Floyd Mayweather walks in. Highlight um, DJ Orator. It was sick. That was one of my first pieces I did. I feel like I remember that. I, I, I got to say, this because every time everybody came in the back, we're like, who the fuck? Is oh, shit. Yeah, there was only a couple <laughs> of people that were allowed through the back of yeah. Greystone, and yeah. Floyd was, Floyd, Floyd and Leo. Yeah. That's pretty much it. Right, right. And then us, when they wouldn't let us in the club, exactly. and then the security wouldn't let us in through the back. Are we sneaking in? Are we sneaking yeah. through the kitchen? That's how we did it. <laughs> so, yeah, I definitely remember seeing Floyd come through a couple yeah, of times, man. Yeah, we came in with Floyd one time. Like, you know, he was like, yo, you can't record him but so much because y'all not paying him. We was like, look, the, this the walk-in experience visually is what I need. Yeah. Like, I don't necessarily need Floyd to be, like, shotting me out or interviewing me. Like, I'm just, the fact to be able to walk in through Greystone that way was just a unique perspective. 
and to highlight the DJ. So yeah, I remember because he he would walk in with like his bag of money. Yeah, his book right? bag. He has his book bag. Like a leather. Yeah, yeah. He's got the black. He's got that. I think it's like a beige. It's like a beige leather bag, and there's just stacks just of hundreds stacks. in it. And his big security guard is always he he, he walks with it in, and security guards are all behind him, and then he takes it off, and there's a security guard that's job that night is just to hold it, and he wants his sprites. You can bring him a Sprite. And every time you run him a Sprite, he'd tip you 100 bucks. Oh, yeah. That's good living. Right. I'm about to do that now. <laughs> hey, Floyd. <laughs> throw him a can. Yeah. <laughs> I got a 12-pack right yeah, here, bro. Here hey, Floyd. <laughs> <laughs> he loved this Sprite, though. I don't know. What it was I weird. Got. But, but, like, yeah. Like, yo, but go, going in through the back of the club is probably one of the coolest fucking experiences. Even when we're doing it, like, you you feel cool. You're like, oh, I'm, I'm cool than everybody else. But that's why I was always good at getting in the clubs because people, you know, even when I got to L.A., it was the same thing, like, in college. Like, everybody wasn't just accepting but I was always good at just making a good connection with the one right guy, like the one stage manager, one security guard. It just took one dude that just felt that had that good energy. So like when, we, when Supper Club was open, I didn't know how I was getting in Supper Club. Supper Club was the shit at the time, but I knew the one stage manager dude just because randomly we were just having a conversation at the club. He was just like, yo, you know, our stage manager here, if you ever want to just come on stage... I was like, hell yeah. yeah. And I always roll by myself, so I'm not like bringing 30 people or mm-hmm. an entourage. It's like, yeah, it's just you. That's the key. Yeah, and then a lot of people would see me and remember me from Revolt. It's like, oh, dope to see you here. And I was able to connect that way. That's fucking awesome. Did you ever try to DJ any, any of the spots here in LA? Yeah, I DJ almost all the spots here. Back then, especially back then when I first got here, I did Supper Club. I was there when OT Genesis pre- premiere cut it at Puff's, uh, uh, what after party was that? What's the big award show out here? The BET, there's a lot of them, bro. I, I, yeah, it probably was BET Weekend. Puff was um, premiering his song, Get Loose. Mm. And OT and Busta came in there. And Busta grabbed me by the neck. And he said, oh, my God. It felt like he chewed 100 cigars. He was like, damn it. We got this record. You got to play this record. And Busta's so damn strong. He's choking me. But I'm telling you, we got this record. <laughs> OT Genesis. Now, here's the thing with OT. I was always an OT Genesis fan because he's the first guy I seen performing in L.A. at Separate Club. He had a song called Touchdown. And I said, that dude is a star. Perform it again. And he performed it again. Every time OT would perform, even before he was big, they would let him perform twice because he was that, sh- like, that good. OT Genesis went up there. I dropped that record. He didn't even have the mic. The whole crowd was going insane. He didn't even have a microphone. He was just up there dancing with the record. Cut it, cut it, hit the bomb. Everybody's like, run it back, run it back. Then he gets the microphone. I'm just like, oh, this is about to be serious. We got that on camera. But um, I definitely performed Supper Club, Penthouse, all those spots. The spots yeah. that's not open anymore. Playhouse, I, I performed at Playhouse a whole lot. That was my spot. It was a ratchet yeah, like, little turn-up spot. Diddy used to throw the 14 parties. They would do, they would do the hip... Remember that we would do hip-hop 14? Yep. At Colony. I remember Colony. Yep. I never did it with Diddy, but I did it with okay. Colony. I, um, shout out to Mark the Spot. He helped me, you know, get in there a few times. I remember Colony. That was yeah. Saturday they did that party, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There would be a Saturday day party into a Saturday night party when Diddy would do the whole Ciroc thing. Crazy, man. Like, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I've either worked at one of the spots you DJed at or... We were, Probably. All, we, we were all definitely in the same location yeah, in the same at room, some for point. Sure. Like, that's what's crazy about this whole nightlife fucking scene. Yeah. And everybody in it. Because, like, it's not just nightlife. Like, we say this is a nightlife hospitality show, but, like, we cross over into entertainment because it's one in the fucking same. Mm-hmm. especially in this city it all crosses over yeah so uh let's get into what happens next when you you get to la you're you're working with revolt you're djing and i'm sure you want more because i can see it in your face you're, there's you're always like <laughs> looking for something more no i want stability yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so revolt was great but it, you know it was the most stable thing so i was like yo like and i got a sixth sense for this stuff like i've been working in entertainment for a while like remember i'm coming from you know, top 10 radio market. So I'm not coming from like some old little hick town. I don't know the game. I know the game and I know when shit's shaking. So I was like, yo, I need to figure out how to secure another gig or I don't know. So that's when I secure my radio job. And that's when um, they start, they launch. So I was part of a startup television network and the startup of Real 92.3 LA out here, which is probably the biggest radio station right now in LA. Oh, no way. Yeah, I was one of the first jocks. I had a night show for about three, four years there. Wow. So I was doing TV during the day from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. And then from 7 to midnight, I was doing radio for like two years straight, 12-hour days. Yeah, he's one of those rare people that comes out to L.A. and just steady grinds. Yeah, we, like didn't, do, we didn't do that. Did you ever get wrapped up in the, in the scene? No. 
Yeah, that's what happened to us. We got wrapped up. Yeah. In, well, the in, thing uh, is, I'm a low key dude. Like I, you know, I'm just low key. Like you know, I, you know, I like my ladies. You know, I have, you know, you, you had a lady or two, but that's in the crib. So it's kind of like I didn't really, I didn't really feel like I needed to be the it guy because I was kind of always the it guy growing up. Like I was the DJ in school. I was the big guy on campus. I was doing campus tours. So I didn't have this like chip on my shoulder I see a lot of people have where they're just trying to be like prove something to themselves I'm like I need money at this point I have right. a kid like I'm out here in LA I'm trying to figure this out like I need the bread like <laughs> to be- and you always said that you always you like to be behind the scenes yeah so you yeah. don't have to be the scene and honestly I do when you when you just play your position things come to you anyway like I didn't have to like chase the girls that I didn't have to do too much like you know I would show up places where all the stars were, and somehow the girls still flocked to me. I don't know. It just, that's what was happening. I was just in the corner minding my fucking business. I'm like, oh, you want to speak to me? I'm awkward. So, <laughs> yeah. but I don't knock the people because it's people that were in the scene like that that I would network with that would help me. So it was still, a, there still was like um, a benefit to people that was running through the scene like that. Like I still have friends to this day that when I want to go out, I know who to call because they run through the scene. I need them. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so it's like, not knocking that at all. Like, if you had to come in here and turn up, do it. Right. So everybody, yeah, everybody plays their part. All right, everybody. so so you're at 92, because 92.3 is now a big fucking deal, and we know a lot of those DJs because they would all play at the fucking club from, like, all the scam artist guys and yeah. everybody and Just Incredible and Deluxe and Five and all them. No, like, no, that's the other station. That was Power. Oh, oh, sorry, my bad. So on our station, it was DJ Head. It was me, DJ Damage, Dre Sinatra, DJ Amen. Charisma came over. Um, Vic One. Those guys. Those are a lot of names that would play a lot yeah, of the yeah. fucking clubs. I'm sure yeah. it's still like the same family, but you yeah. Know. But but at that point, I remember Sinatra for sure. Oh, yeah, I definitely Dre. remember Sinatra. Dre still to this yeah. day is like the club guy. Yeah, okay. he still plays a lot, especially like on, on a lot of the maid nights. Yeah. Yep. Dre Sinatra's that dude. Definitely. Shout out to Dre Sinatra, my Libra brother. <laughs> made Mark Tongue and that whole fucking crew. All, mm. dudes, all those dudes. So, all right, so what happens now? So what happens now? Oh, it all goes away. So, okay, well, but, but why was that 92-3 LA and... Revolt, I did a lot of amazing things, man. We interviewed so many amazing artists. You know the whole spill. I did radio and TV, so y'all can imagine. Yeah. Cool stuff happened, blah, blah, blah. Then it all went away. Um, 2018, that's the one year I do remember, my friend. 2018 was terrible. So 2018 hits, and I'm like, you know, new year. I'm ready to turn up. I had this big um, Remy endorsement. I had this dope-ass commercial. I'm like, this year is starting off with a bang. And um, the year before that, Revolt kind of been teetering off, but they were still paying me. But we weren't doing as much work, but they were still paying me consistently. And I'm like, I know this is going to come to an end soon. And February, it came to an end. But I didn't really have any hard feelings because, I mean, I love doing TV. Like, I love doing TV. I love being on the camera. And they took care of me. I feel like they didn't have to keep paying me for this year of when they were trying to figure things out. So I was like, I appreciate that. Thank you. So I wasn't really butthurt about that. Two months later, I get called into the radio station, and I felt it coming, and I get laid off from the radio station. Why? Still don't know to this day why I got laid off from the radio station. But I knew it was coming because my program director was like, um, you know, we're doing one-on-one sit-downs with everybody. And I was like, okay, cool. And then um, he, like, texted me one day. He's like, hey, make sure you show up on Monday. I was like, I'll show up so you can fire me. Don't worry. Like, the fuck? Like, and then we had another dude that was, um, or maybe I'm saying too much, but I don't care. There's another <laughs> dude that worked there. I won't say his name. Um, he came over, and I worked the night show. So nobody comes over to the radio station at night unless you have a purpose. And he came in and was like, hey, guys, just checking out everything. I was like, oh, you saying your goodbyes? And he just had this stone cold, like, stuck face. Because I was like, dude, I know what's going I can feel when something's going on. I was like, I get it. Like, I don't give a fuck. At this point. So they laid me off. Um, I thanked them because at the end of the day, laid me off or not, the radio station is what brought stability to my life. It was brought me health care for me and my son. Like, Revolt was dope, but the radio was stable. It was like, this is stable, real deal money, opportunities, sales, endorsements. Like, I was so appreciative. So I walked out of there and... You know, they gave me a severance. I took, like, a few vacations. I went to Korea, went to Canada, uh, went to Jamaica. You know, I was like, I never got to live. Think about it. From 17 on, I've been working nonstop. I've never been anywhere. I haven't experienced shit. I was like, it's time to, like, do me. So I did that for a few weeks, well, a few months. 
Then I was like, okay, the money's running low. What am I going to do? So I go around the country trying to find somewhere to work. I went to uh, Summer Jam to work with Hot 97. I went to Atlanta, went to Miami, just trying to find places to work. And work never came, y'all. It never came. So one day I'm just, you know, depressed and sad, trying to figure out how I'm going to live life, trying to drive a lift. That didn't even work right. I couldn't even get regular jobs. Like, you know, like I have other skills, right? Like I could have did social media, you know, you know how to do social media marketing. I was on LinkedIn and all that shit. I sent out like 5,000 resumes. Like I redid my resume 100. I could not get a simple job. I thought, what the fuck I got to do? I like, I couldn't get anything. Like literally it was like God. I was like, at this point, God is telling me I'm not supposed to have a job. I don't know what he got in store for me, but a job ain't it. Because I can't even do lift right. So, um... This it was yo it was depressing yo I could but, imagine we we we've been there where um, nothing goes right you're just like yo dude, what the fuck I'm man I'm sitting there and I'm like it's it's on me it's on me I got 24 hours in the day I'm gonna sit here on this fucking laptop and I'm gonna sit here and I'm gonna send a resume out to everything I'm I have my reel I redid my reel my EPK I'm gonna send this out to every agency. No agency hit me back. <laughs> so, so I feel like every agency in the world I sent it to, like, hey, I'm DJ Damage. If you want to represent me, nobody responded until like four months later, a random agency hit me back. Was like, oh yeah, come in. I didn't even know which one it was. I was like, oh shit, I don't even know what I sent them. I was changing shit for people, but um. This is how Hollywood Unlocked started. One day. Well, hold on. Before you get to that, where were you at mentally? Because this depressed. is the part. This is the part that I, that. No, <laughs> I, I get that, but get, get more in it because this is no, the part I'm that. You. Yeah, this is the part that people get to, and like they don't. And this is where most people would give up. So what kept you going? <sighs> Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> it's there. I was depressed. Like first of all, I've been depressed before this. Yeah. Now I got to sit in it. Like I was already clinically depressed. But were you alone at this time or? I was always alone. My brother was living with me at the time, but I was still like alone. Like it was just me. Like I don't have like immediate family out here. I don't have many friends. Yeah. I'm like a loner anyway. I'm an introvert. So just stuck, man. Like when that shit hit me, man, I was just like, I didn't went through a big breakup with my son's mom. I had issues with my own mom. Like, like picture you working nonstop and you can push it to a side and then. That shit gets removed and all everything just falls on you. Like just yep. like you have these little shaky little pillars holding things up and it moves and everything fell on everything fell on top of me. I was so depressed. And I was like, I heard Game of Thrones is good. And I looked at it, I was like, it's a lot of seasons and these episodes are long. And I just clocked in. I was not used to not doing something. I'm not used to waking up and having free time. Like I always had a schedule, like, oh, I'm busy. You know, everybody knew, oh, you can't talk to him, he's busy. I lost friends because I was so busy. So people that I wanted to check on was just like, oh, now you reach out two years later? I'm like, bro, I worked 12-hour days. My bad. Like, oh, it was bad. So I was super depressed. So this is where depression helped me out. I would go get hookah every day with my boy Big Mike, who used to work at, um, he still works at iHeart. Shout out to Big Mike. And I'd be getting hookah. And in there was Jason Lee. And Jason Lee always watched Revolt because he always wanted to do TV. He was like, oh, he would just pick my brain. And Jason Lee had his own thing, Hollywood Unlocked. His own brand he owns. Yeah, like he's already doing dope shit. So I was just curious of why he gave a fuck about what I was doing. I'm just like down and out. Maybe he didn't know I was down and out, but I was down and out. Um, and he was like, yo, you should come on the show one day. And I was like, all right, well, fuck, I ain't got nothing else to do. Like, why not? <laughs> so I go in there, and he, he hits me up after. He's like, yo, the fans really like you. I want you to come back on. So I come back on another time. He was like, yo, I think like, I don't know. I feel like we should try to figure out how to keep you on the show. And this is not my format. So... I'm on there just really ad libbing, just talking shit, cause they're crazy. They're talking about crazy shit, you know, super stuff I've never talked about. I'm on radio and television. It's super like fun, but clean cut, not explicit. They're going crazy. So I'm like, I don't even know if I fit the format <laughs> for this show, but all right. And we started, and he like gave me a check, and I was like, wait, we get paid for this? He's like, yeah, man, we don't do this shit for free. And it, the check, I remember that first check. It was just enough to cover my bills, like just enough. Like probably need a hundred extra dollars for like food or something, but it was like just enough. And I was like, man, if I can get like one or two DJ gigs and do this, I could be all right for a little while. And I started doing Hollywood Unlocked. Um, that was cool. And about nine months later, the same company that laid me off called us in for a national show. So I went from doing local, doing LA and Vegas, to now we do 63 markets. So the same company that laid me off had to bring me back in the door and put me national. <laughs> Shit. <laughs>
It's fucking wow. It's yeah. amazing how life works, man. Yeah, yo. Dude. When I tell you it was and and I'm, and I'm gonna tell you this. This is where it gets deep for me. My la- like my last dream was just to be a syndicated radio personality. I was like, I've done it all, but I wish I could just be like I could just say I did syndicated radio. And when I got laid off, I was like. I mean, I had a good run because you know, you know, you're gonna get you're gonna get fired in entertainment. You know, you're gonna get fired. It's inevitable. I was like, I mean, I just wish I just had that syndication. You know, it would just been dope to like, you know. And I was just kind of like a little hurt by that, but I was like, you know, it is, it is what it is. And you don't like to live life with regret, re- regrets, but that would have been my one regret. Like, man, I wish I could have just really did syndicated radio. So when that shit happened, y'all don't understand the like the feeling that went through my body. I'm just like, yo. This is fucking mind blowing. The same place that just laid me off brings me back nationally. You can't make it up. Can't make it up. Bro, how'd you walk back into that building? I just <laughs> very humble. Yeah. Because it, it, you you have the to way be. I walked out was very humble because yeah. that's how. And I, I tell everybody if you listen to this, if you're in entertainment, if you get laid off, you get fired. It's business. It's not personal. Do not put out nasty tweets don't say anything disrespectful because if i would have did any of that it would have been so comfortable bringing us back in yeah it would have definitely been a lot of pushback when it came back in it was just like oh my god we love them she's coming back that's what everybody said even if somebody didn't like me there they would have been outvoted and that's how you got to move like you got you're going to be outvoted because it's like i only walk around with positive energy if you hate me you're just a nasty person (laughs) you're just like okay that's on you so when i came back like i was getting these big hugs and signs and people like oh i want to take you to call i'm so glad you're back because no one knew why i got laid off in the first place i had five open endorsements when i got laid off it cost the company money to lay me off but they still did it but man it's so it's so good to hear that because you can't take things personally man like i've I've been i've just this recent month I've, i've auditioned 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 putting in good work i feel like it's solid and i'm not getting anything so like like last night i was like what the fuck is wrong it's not coming my way, but you just have to wait. Because every now and then, they'll, you know, life will sprinkle a little something. Like, you got that. Oh, no, I'm the king of wait now. Like, yeah. I, I'm starting this new company with my boy, uh, Low Key. It's like a boutique creative uh, agency, and we work with, like, brands and come up with marketing plans, whatever. But he wants something quick, quick. Oh, man, I feel like, like, dude, no. This is going to be something, but you're going to have to wait about a year or two. Like, all these ups and downs are part of the fucking journey. And you want them. You don't want it to come because these things in the middle is what teaches you and what preps you to sustain in it. If I didn't get denied, if I didn't get fired, I wouldn't even know how to... If I never got pushed back my whole life, how would I deal with getting laid off for the first time, right? What if I never got any pushback? What if it was always peaches and cream for DJ damage? I would have been blowing my... What the fuck? How are you laying me? I would have did that. But I'm so used to it. It was just like, oh, okay, cool. I'm going to figure out how to pivot. You know, don't say anything too rash. You know, just, and that's how it is. Like, you got to really, like, the, the, the true success, the true reward is in the journey. Because you know what happens when you get that thing you're looking for? You're going to want to do it again. You're going to want something else. All the reward is in the journey. When you get it, it's like, oh, yeah, okay, what's the next thing? Like, you celebrate for, like, one day, and then you're like, yeah, you know, everybody's like, we're proud of you, yeah, but I got more to do. That's what you're going to tell them because you're ambitious. So everything, every part of the reward is in the journey. Dude, green thought, lights all green day. Green lights today, all man. day, man. He's just dropping knowledge on us left and right. That's what I love about these talks. Like, it really makes me feel better. Yeah. Like, and I'm sure anyone listening, you know, we all go through the same struggles, you know, and, yeah. and we have different things that we're trying to achieve, but it's all the same struggle. Yeah. And it's fucking just awesome to hear your story and how you were just able to, like, again, I'm sure there was way more downsides. Oh, my God. You know, but like. And I'm sorry for talking so fast because. When I get in these spaces and people ask the story, it's so hard to tell it because I'm like, if y'all knew all the pieces that connected. Y'all don't know when I first auditioned from Revolt, I bombed. I uh, went up to New York with my manager on like a, a those China, uh, Chinese buses, like a China bus, that's what we call it. It's like $25 to go to New York. And I went up there and they gave me a script to rehearse. And then they had something else for me to read. And I'm not like good at memorizing really quick. And I ruined it, yo. Like I really like, Rolled back to Philly with my head on the window, like about to cry. Yeah. I, damn near, I definitely shed a tear or two. I'm like, I blew it. This, this was my my chance, and I blew it. And then... How old are you? What, probably 21, 22? And at that point, you're not even thinking there's way more to life. You're just like, I blew my shot. I have I to find something I just knew I wanted to do, do TV. And I had, like, how many people have the opportunity to do that interview or do that audition? It's not, not that many people. And no. I was like, I fucking blew it. 
but the scary part was, and like I said, I'm going back now. The scary part was about the revolt thing is I told nobody I went to audition. No one. Only person that knew was my son's mom because she lived with me at the time and my manager because she went with me. No one knew. So I'm DJing on the radio and high DJ on the radio. I don't play with the music out loud. I just play in my speak, like in my headphones. I don't like glaring music like that. I like to hear everything and like hear my voice. Um, I'm in there DJing. I'm like locked in, you know, it's six o'clock and going crazy. And my boy, he goes behind me. He moves one of my headphones, takes one of the ears off and go, you know, you got that revolt job, right? And I'm like, shook. I told no one. I told no one. So I'm like, how the hell do you, like, you, how do you even know I went out for it? He was like, yeah, one of my boys work up there. And he said, um, they're hiring this guy named DJ Damage. Hey, you're the only DJ Damage I know. Wow. And I was like, yo, this is wild. So you bombed it, but still got it. Still got so it. So obviously you didn't bomb it as bad as you thought you did. I watched the footage over somehow. I found it on Vimeo. It was up there randomly. And it wasn't as bad as I thought. It wasn't. I think, and it wasn't necessarily what I was saying. It was the body language. And I was like, I could see how they thought this was good. But I thought I bombed it. I thought I ruined it, bro. I was crying. <laughs> and I don't cry. That's the crazy thing about the entertainment industry, and we know this so well from acting. It's like you have your concept of what you think it is, but yeah. fucking they look at like the casting director is looking for something completely different than what you're thinking, and that's why you fucking got it. Like that's craziness that bro. you. But that, yeah, the last thing I I, I, I auditioned for, I well, I mean, the last thing that I booked, I just I didn't have time. I just threw something together, and I was like, that was terrible, and I didn't think about it. And then later that day, I got the call that I booked it. I'm like, what? The fuck? It's always so unexpected. Yeah. That's my life, man. It's my life. I, I can't make this shit up. Like, some of the stuff, and that's why I'm like, if you're not spiritual, if you don't believe in manifestation, if you don't believe in the universe, you think I'm crazy talking, maybe. But I have proof. Yeah. Like, it's certain things that's, it's tangible proof. Like, this is nothing else but, like, manifestation. Yeah. Like, I come to L.A. Grammy weekend. I said, I'm moving here. I get a job and move here on my birthday. That's not a coincidence. That can't be a coincidence. Right. Like, come on. No. I, don't, I mean, I don't believe in coincidence. I believe everything happens for a reason. It has to. Like, it's, and as you see, everything is so, especially in your story, because it's, so, it's so frontal, everything connected. Everything led to everything. something else, but never in the way you expected it. Everything. And I think that's what fucks a lot of people up, is people have expectations of, I want my life to go like this, or they have this vision of what it should look like, what the dream should look like, and they're not seeing the universe as signs of adapting, where it's like, you know, man, even what I'm doing, I, I always wanted to act so I could be a spokesperson for mental health and be a motivational speaker. I always thought I had to do it through acting. I never thought it would come through a whole other way mm -hmm. of fucking doing See? it. But because I was open to adapting, I mean, Danny, you talk about how your accident was the best thing that ever happened to you. You would have never expected Fuck no. to be in this position. It's like everybody, you have a plan, but that plan never works out the way that you planned it in your head. Nope. You have the plan and then throw that shit out because it's going to be. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what's deep about me? I never had a plan. Like, I, ne I never had a plan. I just knew what I wanted to do. I didn't have like, and that's why people were like, when I was in college, people would try to make fun of me like, oh, are you just going to go to school to be a DJ? I was like, I guess. I didn't have like. I didn't have the blueprint. Yeah. I just knew what I wanted. I knew the goal. And I was like, I'm just going to kind of like take risks and try things out. And you have to be curious. You have to be open to shit. Yep. I, I still, to this day, people are like, you know, what's the five-year plan? I don't fucking know. I don't know. Yeah. I don't want to buy a house. Yeah. So I'm going to save money. But I don't know. I don't know where I'm going. I never knew where I was going. I never knew I was going to be here on this podcast in LA. I still wake up in the middle of the night and look around at my apartment and like freak out. Like, how the fuck did I get here? <laughs> I swear to God. Like, it happens. Like, every once in a while, I wake up, and I'm like, how am I paying this rent? How did this all happen? <laughs> I mean, yes. like, wait. Yo, I do that a lot. Yeah. Actually, like, I'm glad you said it, because, like, yo, there's plenty of times where I'm looking around, and I'm like, yo, I'm a kid from fucking Queens who grew up. I was supposed to be a firefighter. How the fuck did I end up here? Bruh. Like, what am I doing with my life? And I like what you said. It's even better to have that just know what you want. Yeah. yeah. And be open. Because you, cause you, you're more um, mendable to situations. Like, if you just stuck on, I want to do it this way, arr, 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 you're missing blatant opportunities. Like, you're missing exits. Yeah. Because you're stuck on this one route you have on your GPS. You're missing all the cool exits that can get you, you know what I'm saying? So, you just got to be open to shit, especially when you do entertainment. Be open to everything. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a great analogy, man. Getting lost is, is some of the best times that I've ever had. And yeah. It, and literally, like, getting lost, going through L.A. somewhere, I find, I find something I've never seen before. 
And I didn't plan to go there. So you can apply that to life. I feel like you got to lose yourself to be able to find yourself. And like, and like you said, the blueprint yeah. and people want to know like, yeah, what's the blueprint to get famous? What's the blueprint to be successful? Like there isn't. Everybody's journey is different. There is no blueprint because I can't do what you're doing. You can't do what Danny's doing. Danny can't do what Nick's doing. We're all on these different. So even if you had a blueprint to show me, it wouldn't fucking work for me. It wouldn't matter. So I think that's where a lot of people, you know, everybody's looking for the, for the key to life. And it's like, yo, figure, figure it out yourself because your life is different than everybody else's. Yeah, it's, and it's tough, y'all. Just know it's tough. It's tough. Nobody said it was supposed to be easy. Jeez, it's tough. But, that's the, but isn't that the rewarding part? All that toughness you went through and look at what you got. Kind of, man. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> so, I remember some of these times it's like, so, oh, so, I don't want to go back to that. No, definitely not. But where you, so where you at today, though, now? Like right now, what projects do you have going on? Because you hustle and you got a ton of shit yeah, going man, on. So like, so, what you are know, you doing now? Of course, we got Hollywood Unlock. Hollywood Unlock is a podcast originally, which transformed into a um, national syndicated radio show, iHeartRadio. And then got picked up as a TV show. So Hollywood Unlock is three different jobs in one. A lot of people don't realize that. They just think I'm just doing one thing. It's like, oh, you got the podcast. I'm like, do you know it's a TV show? And it's also a national radio show? You didn't know that. Oh, and I'm just saying that to y'all. It's just people like, oh, yeah, yeah you got this. I'm like, dude, it's a lot of work. Outside of that, I'm doing photography for Serato, which is super dope, full circle moment. Because as a DJ, I always use Serato, you know. I always wanted to be featured by Serato. I always said that. I was like, yo, I wish I could do like a dope Serato feature. Can you, uh, can you explain what Serato is to so people? It's um, the DJ um, software. Yeah. Like that all the DJs use. I mean, they got, they got Redbox. They have virtual DJ, but 98% of DJs use Serato. So like to be working with Serato in any way as a DJ is like a dream. And I always wanted to be featured by Serato. And um, one of my good friends picked up a job there. He manifested that. And, you know, I did some photos for his son for graduation. He was like, yo, I'm going to see if I can get you to do some photos for Serato. You got any, got any work? Mind you, when I worked at Revolt, when I worked at Radio, I told y'all what I did. I don't know if I said it on uh Yeah, on Mike. Going into- I would be in the pits. When I was working with Puff on the, on the music videos, when, when, when I'm not interviewing, I have my camera. I'm getting all this behind the scenes. So he was like, yo, you can make like a little portfolio. I was like, okay. I got stuff of Lil Wayne, Puff Daddy, people on stage. So I had a dope ass like photography portfolio and I was able to, to sell that. And I always bring that up because it's like, it's kind of like one of my minor jobs, but it's a job I really love to do. Like I really love taking pictures. And then um, that's pretty much it. And then like, I do a lot of freelance stuff for like companies. So you'll see me if you go on my Instagram at the real DJ damage. Uh, I've done some hosting for Lexus. I've done some hosting for Old Spice, Remy Martin. And those are kind of like freelance, um, influencer style gigs. But I do a lot of those as well. I, I work a lot with brands. Yo, man, this guy does it all. Amazing. Just trying to survive. That's how I started. It just started just trying to survive. Yeah, but homie, but 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 but, but, but but there's trying to survive, and then there's people that try to survive just by you know doing little things. But you're not only surviving, you're thriving, doing what you love. Most people survive by doing a job that they fucking hate, working forty hours a week That's and live true. for their weekend. Like yeah, you're you're cre- you're feeding your creative side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. which yeah. a lot of people don't get to do. Or a lot of people, you know, like me and Danny, we have to juggle and balance. Like we have to do other jobs besides our creativity because we can't just get to focus. You get to wake up every day and be creative yeah that's awesome it's true but i think um you learn a lot from those jobs you got that you kind of don't like you learn so much man and you just when you're in it before you do take that leap like learn everything you can learn because there's so much value in those jobs there's so many ways to leverage those positions for what you want especially and what you do man it's so many ways to leverage that um, to add to your creative side. So just always keep an open mind because you're going to have to have a, a nine to five. Like I have a creative nine to five and like creative gigs I do and they still feel like nine to fives. Like even though they're creative, it's like, shit, this is like a drag. But it's like finding ways to leverage that into something you want down the line. Fuck yeah, man. That's some great <laughs> advice. And this has been a great episode. I hope a lot of people can take a lot. I'm sure a lot of people can take a, away from a lot of the things that you were saying in your story, which is fucking wild and we've left so much out of it we're gonna have to bring you back for part two eventually please yeah i mean i I really needed that personally and i'm sure someone else listening is gonna feel the same way so thank you for dropping all that knowledge all those green lights that we like to talk about now yeah man and fucking this is what i say man this is what i say to all my students stop trying to stop a lot of us are doing the right thing already and some at some point 
when you're walking down that road, we just stop. I do it too all the time. I'd be like, why did I stop doing that? Like nothing went wrong. It's just you get in your head. So if I could say anything for anybody to remember, stop trying to stop. Go. Full speed. Just go. And everything will just kind of come. It's going to have to. That, yo, man. Fucking, this is great. This seems like a nice place to take a break. I appreciate it. Story yo, time to end the... Story time? Yeah, so the favorite way we like to get out of, we'll get everybody out of here is you've been around the nightlife scene. Yes. You've been around some of these parties. What's your craziest memory from one of these events you were doing that you were just like sat back and you're like, yo, what the fuck am I a part of right now? Um, It was a time I was DJing and I got jumped by security. Oh, shit. <laughs> yep, got my ass Why you were DJing? Yep. No, after, after. Oh, after? So it was just... So it's not a fun story. Um, I mean, it's funny. <laughs> Might be funny for us. Kind of funny for us. <laughs> got my ass whooped, got sent to the hospital. So I was DJing this um, club called Samba at the time. And Samba was known to just be doing a lot of shady shit, right? Like, I know other promoters were getting, like, duct tape in the kitchen type stuff. Like, real weird. Where was this? This was in Philly. Okay. <laughs> and I just never get why did people would let them do that to them. I'm like, why do you get... Like, and they still go back and work there. <laughs> they would still go... The promoters would still go back and work there. I'm like... Uh, okay, but I never had any problems with the dudes. I was just DJ and leave. So one day, um, sec- Philly has some of the worst security guards in the world. The worst security guards in the world. So uh, one day is my boy. Uh, I'm DJing, and we're done. The club's done. And my boy's trying to come up to the balcony where I DJ at. So it's just me, my brother, and my boy. So he's trying to come up, and security's like, no, you can't go up there. He's like, yo, we come here every week, and you do this every week. I help my man with his equipment. I don't understand you. So my, 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 my guy, he's short, but he's super strong. Like, like you can just look at him, and he, you can tell he got, like, that old North Philly hood strength. Like, Solid. he played football. Like, his fingers are strong. Like, you can just tell he was a strong. So security's trying to manhandle him, but he can't. So that's pissing him off. So he finally works his way upstairs against security's will, and, like, they just start tussling real bad. So eventually, like, other security run up there, why they touch something and they handcuff my boy. And I'm just like, see, man, this is why we just got to get out of here. Like, they handcuffing my boy for no reason. He's just trying to help me carry my turntables out of here. This is too much. So the owner comes up. And this place um, had two owners. It was the owner and then the owner's son. We usually just coordinate with the owner's son. He was like a young dude. He was an asshole, too. But, like, I never had problems with anybody because I didn't have a reason to. So the owner comes up there. And he's like, what the fuck's going on up here? And we're just like, yo, they handcuffing my boy. They need to let him go. And he immediately turns away from all of what we're talking about and picks up this Ciroc bottle and said, who the fuck brought this Ciroc bottle in here? And I'm just like, I don't know, because we're in the middle of my boys getting handcuffed, getting beat up. Like, I don't fucking know. Like, Maurice. Maurice is like a promoter on the host. Like, you get on the mic and stuff. And he's like, you telling me Maurice brought this back in here? And we're like, yes, like, who cares? It's a Ciroc bottle, like, it's a club. So apparently I didn't know that he didn't sell Ciroc bottles. And Marwees was bringing Ciroc bottles in there to try to stunt. And for him, this is a big no-no. For some reason, this is like he's, um, this owner was ex, uh, like, police deputy or whatever, but he's also, like, in the mob. So he was, like, some scary dude to not play with. I didn't care. I just wanted to leave. So he calls, he calls, uh, he calls, Marwee's up. And I'm saying Marwee's name is wrong because the owner calls him Maurice, and that's not his name. So he's like, Maurice, get up here. And this dude's like 6'5", whereas like Stacey Adams, like old school, scary looking dude. Like little, you know, Jerry Curl, like old school dude. So just get this in your mind. Old school, tall dude. So Marwee's is like 5'2". He's some little guy. He comes up there. He's like, hey, what's going on? He's like, what I tell you about bringing bottles in my club? Marwee's is like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He says, stop talking. Marwee's did not stop talking. He kept trying to explain. This man slapped Marwee's in the face, right? Slaps him to the wall. Boom. You hear this big sound. He comes to the wall. He takes his shoe and kicks him in the front of his face. Like on some Mortal Kombat, <laughs> finish him. I'm talking about kicked him in the front. Can you imagine somebody getting slapped to the wall? kind of sliding down and somebody just stone kicking him in the front of his face. I said, oh shit, we got to get out of here. <laughs> so while, so while this was going on, more security guards kind of came up and one got behind me. So as soon as he kicked Marwee's in the face, the security guard 
does like this ninja elbow chop to the right side of my head. So I fall to the left. And then he takes his knee and chops me to the left. So wait, am I saying it right? He hits me from the right with his right elbow. I fall to the left and he takes his left knee and he kicks me to the wall. So literally I'm like, <laughs> pinballing yeah. and this is a big dude in like ninja boots like big strong security dude so I fall to the wall kind of like the dude Marwee's and he's just sitting there and I'm just watching him it was like it was like I was an out of body experience I'm watching this dude and he's just like ninja kicking me uh, 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 uh. I'm, I'm literally like it's funny it's not funny but it's funny He, I think he broke one of my ribs but he was kicking uh, 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 uh. I'm just watching him and I just can't believe like what a great form this man has. Like he kills me. <laughs> like he must really like do like he does this. Like, I was kind of proud. It was like really sharp form. Like his arms was like ah, ah. So the son, the owner's son, runs upstairs and he jumps on top of me, like, what are y'all doing? Why are y'all beating up the DJ? And he's like, and, and security didn't know. He's like, oh, I just don't, you know. Basically, he's like, I seen him kick him in the face. I just wanted something too. That's how they are in Philly. These dudes are bloodthirsty in Philly. Oh, damn. So um went to the hospital. I had a literal shoe print. This dude was good. I thought he was good. He had the, the whole shoe print was on my rib, like as a bruise. <laughs> um, Size 12, Stacey Adams. And we, we was going to uh, suit up the club, but it got weird. And I, ain't, I don't really mess with that kind of stuff anyway. And then Marwee's, who got kicked in the face and had like a, literally like a red eye, he had like a patch on his eye, goes back and works there. <laughs> he goes back and works there. Who kicks you in the front of your face and you go back and promote? With a patch. <laughs> Who does that? Like a fucking pirate. He looked crazy. Like, I'm talking about blip butt. Like, he got literally kicked in the front of his face. Can you imagine somebody kicking you in the front of your face? It's the most, it's the great, one of the craziest things I've ever seen. I've never seen a move like that. That's like fucking. Like the slap to like a front kick. It was like, oh, this is, this is gangster. It was like the, the, the Sparta kick. So, right? The 300 yeah, Sparta yeah, kick. It was just like that, but to the face. To the face. <laughs> on the wall. So it wasn't like he could even have like a free flow. It was yeah. just like, boom. I was like, oh. And then I got my ass whooped. <laughs> so um, so that club didn't last long because they played with the wrong people. They played with me. I was on the radio at the time. Uh, my radio station never worked the club again. And then I was on the radio, and any time I could, I just dissed the club. I said, man, that's whacking in club samba. And it started becoming a phrase in the city where it's like, man, that's whacking in Club Samba. Where they try, to re they try to rebrand it. They try to change the name and everything. It's like, ah, it's still Club Samba. And I remember one day, this is like the highlight. I remember one day we were driving by, me and my brother, and we seen it. It was closed. And we just went in front of it. And we took this Instagram picture of us like pretending to pee on it. <laughs> so like, can you imagine like two guys like peeing on the front of the club? You see the club name and everything. And my brother puts his thumb out like, <laughs> and I'm telling you like, Things didn't go viral back in those times, but on Facebook, like, everybody was cracking up about that. Like, we really ruined the branding of that club. That's so funny. So, we got the last laugh. We hit them where it hurt. We took all their money. Bro, I feel like for you, everything always comes full circle. <laughs> I mean, you have to make it come full circle. I mean, he whooped my ass, dude. Like, I didn't even know what to do. I was like, I could have never beat this dude. Even if I seen it coming, it was no way. This dude was like Ninja Warrior, man. His... <laughs> His boots was tied up here. It was like he was ready to kick somebody today. I, and that's how people, that's how the security in Philly are, man. They, they bloodthirsty. Oh, they come man. ready to, they don't come to defuse. They come to fight. And that's... DJ Damage was born. Yeah. Oh, man. Where'd you, how'd you get your name, by the way? Um, I used to be an engineer when I was uh, like freshman in high school. And I was DJ Duel. That didn't work. So I was like, guys, I'm trying to come up with a new DJ name. What y'all think? And one of my guys that was rapping at the time was like, yo, you should be DJ Damage because you do damage. Yep. <laughs> and I was like, that's pretty lame. But I don't got nothing else, so we're going to roll with it for now. <laughs> and everybody thought it was lame for a couple years. I had to really, like, ride that out. They was like, DJ Damage? Who calls yourself Damage? Now I can't pe get people to stop calling me Damage. <laughs> like, oh, my, can you imagine, like, I'm 12, like, going to school, like, yeah, I'm DJ Damage. They're like, huh, okay. <laughs> Whack. Lame. <laughs> 
He's a DJ. His name's Damage. They were, oh, they played me so bad. <laughs> but come full circle, now nobody plays it. They be like, oh, we get it because you're DJ fuck up. We get it now. You da- yeah, Fuck you damaged up. the party. <laughs> Yo, Damage, we appreciate you being on the fucking show and your stories, and we can't wait to have you back to keep pushing it on. Thank but, you. Thanks, man. Thank yo, you so man, much you for were, coming. You were definitely inspirational. We appreciate the hell out of it. As you guys heard him drop multiple times, The Real DJ Damage on Instagram. Uh, drop a couple other things that you have. Yeah, man, at The Real DJ Damage on Instagram and Twitter. And if you into media hosting, if you want to be on TV or radio one day, legendarymediagroup.com. Hit me up. Yo, we appreciate that. Yo, thank you very much. Danny? I'm on the website right now. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, we'll see you guys next week on The Chaos. Thank you, everybody. We out. Peace. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Chaos Control, hosted by Mikey Tableman and Danny J. Gomez. Producer and audio engineer, Nick Dewar. Please be sure to like, subscribe, and leave a review on the Apple Podcast app or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Join us next week for more Chaos.